welcome to the Education News Show. On today's show, we'll learn a little bit more about the Met Professional Academy, our newest program. You'll also hear from Superintendent Dr. Denton Santorelli and our Deputy Superintendent Dr. Heather Cruz. We're also going to introduce you to our Spelling Bee winner. It's all coming up next, right here on the Education News Show. Congratulations goes out to this year's Spelling Bee Champion. Aaron Dunsey and our media relations team had an opportunity to visit with him just seconds after he took his big trophy. Let's take a look. Hi, I am here with Seth Ray, Apache Elementary School student who is the winner of our 2015 District Spelling Bee Competition. This was an exciting day today, Seth. What grade are you in at Apache Elementary School? Seventh grade right now. So this is very, very exciting. This is your first experience coming to the district office for the Spelling Bee competition. Is that correct? Yes. I understand that you actually won today's competition in the 25th round. That was pretty impressive. Tell me how you feel today. Well, I feel not quite as nervous as when I came in. That's wonderful. You did a great job. Now, what was your winning word today? Variance. Can you respell that word for our audience? Yes. V A R I A N C E. Variance. You did an excellent job today. I understand that you're going to go to the Regional B on February 20th. Yes. Are you super excited about that? Super nervous? Or how do you feel? Something in between the two, really. Well, knowing how well you did today, I think you have a very, very good shot. And more than anything else, we want to say congratulations to you for doing such a great job, and also good luck to you at your regional spelling bee. Thank you. Governor Ducey's budget proposal calls for a mandatory 5% cut in what are deemed non-classroom expenses in order to put classrooms first. What the proposal does not make clear is that non-classroom expenses provide vital resources to the students and teachers in our schools. The three to five million dollars in cuts Peoria Unified would be forced to make would stifle access to technology, impact the school lunch program, compromise security staff positions, eliminate school nurses, and could limit the extracurricular activities available to students. These cuts affect the health, safety, and academic excellence our community has come to expect. What is proposed as hashtag classrooms first has a very real impact on your child's classroom. Stay informed and take action by visiting our website to learn more about non-classroom expenses and how they will impact your student, your school, your family, and your community. I recently had an opportunity to sit down with a bright young star from Centennial High School, Ian Mullane, the City of Peoria Council Youth Liaison. Let's listen in. Well, one of the ways we like to measure our success in the Peoria Unified School District is how well our graduates do, not just in our system, but when they go on and leave us and go out into the world. One of those who will have no problem as he graduates from Centennial High School is our very own Ian Mullane. He's the student body president here at Centennial High School, and he also serves as the youth council liaison for the city of Peoria. I'm so pleased to have him here with me today. Ian, thank you for joining of me. Of course, thank you so much for having me. Tell us a little bit about what it means to serve in, in such a role as the Peoria Youth Council Liaison. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Definitely. Well, it's a pretty incredible role that we have here in the city of Peoria. We are unique as the only city in the state of Arizona that actually has a position like this. And what it is is that I, as a member of the youth here in the city of Peoria, get to sit on city council itself. Um, and I get to participate in all, the, in all the activities and meetings that the city council members have. So I actually was sworn in as an official council member. Of course, I can't vote. I'm a non-voting member itself. But I receive the same packet as every other council member receives. I attend all the meetings, and I receive all the briefings as far as what goes on in the city of Peoria. So I really provide that youth and student voice 
about different things that our community needs here in the city of Peoria, what students need, what schools need, and overall, and that representative for the youth all across the city, which is a great, great opportunity that I have. So you're really representing the whole student body, not, not just for Centennial High School, but really from the Northwest Valley, from our community, and from our district. Do you feel like your voice has an impact when you sit at the table and are among the other council members? I definitely think so. I mean, our council members here in the city of Peoria really, really do care about what the youth think. We have a ton of creative, uh, entrepreneurial individuals who are part of the Peoria Unified School District here in the city of Peoria, and also part of different school districts that perhaps might be in Peoria as well. And they're always looking to see what do the youth want? What is going to make them successful in the future? And whenever I have a suggestion or a comment, they always pay attention. And they're always intrigued because, I mean, it's a totally different perspective coming from a student, especially when growing up in the kind of different society nowadays that we're growing up in. Um, so having that kind of perspective, I think, brings an incredible source of knowledge to the table itself. And they're always, always willing to hear me. And sometimes when they hear me and they may say, well, you know, it's nice to think about the idea in a different way, or nice to think about that sort of topic in a different way. Um, that's kind of what I do, and I think they definitely hear me, and I think it's a great way for students to just be heard and overall, you know, have a voice at the table. Well, you represent us so well in that capacity, <laughs> and I know you're involved in a lot of other extracurricular mm -hmm. things, very involved here at Centennial High School. Tell us a little bit about, about your level of involvement and, and what your interests are here at Centennial yes, High School. Yes, definitely. So I'm very much involved in student government here. Uh, I've been the class president for a couple years for my class and just this past year ran for student body president and it's been an incredible experience. Um, student council has been, uh, as far as impact, how it does in the school and the community, it's been incredible and astonishing as far as what we've been able to accomplish this year. I'm also involved in another organization called the Future Business Leaders of America. It's a career and technical student organization that really wants to strive to help students develop business skills that they can use in their futures. I was, have been a state officer for the organization for the past three years, and actually this past year I was elected as a national officer. So I represent, there are six regions in total for our national organization. I represent the western region, so Arizona and all the states of Washington, California, Utah, um, 10 states in total that I represent. So incredible things that I've I had the opportunity to be involved with here that this Peoria Unified School District has provided me, and also the city of Peoria. I'm also involved, of course, in the council youth liaison, but also as the youth advisory board chairman which is, I guess, the best way that I could put it, is the student council for the city of Peoria. So we talk about different youth proposals that come about from city council, different things that pertain to the youth, and overall try to create a positive atmosphere for students growing up here. Yeah. So needless to say, you're busy. Yes. Just a little bit. <laughs> and on top of all of that, you still managed to obtain just a remarkable GPA. You're among the top in your class. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for next year? Once you graduate, you leave us. So where are you off to? I was actually just recently accepted to Harvard University in Massachusetts, um, which was incredible. Small little university, no <laughs> yeah. one's heard of it. That's fantastic. Yeah. It was incredible, thank you. Uh, I was ecstatic when I found out. I had told no one that I had applied because uh, I was nervous I wasn't going to get in. Um, but it, it's just incredible the opportunities that I've, I've been able to have here, um, where I've come from, in this district and also in this city. And I know that without those things, I would not be attending Harvard, of all schools to go to. But I get to visit the campus for the first time in April and I'll be starting over there in September. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you plan to pursue as far as a degree at Harvard, and what are your future aspirations? I'd love to study both, I concentrate in government and also economics. I love the mixture of both. I love studying things of government, policy, big passions of mine. But I also like to study business. Um, I'm very much interested in seeing how the economy works and how, how we can best move forward in effective ways to grow our economy, expand it. So in the future, I'd love to pursue something in the realm of public policy as far as best seeing how we can best solve the problems in our society that we currently face and also how we can successfully move forward to provide opportunities for students to receive good quality educations, how we can provide opportunities for people to start businesses, have success, how we can provide health care um, to many people who still need it today. Just being in a role in which I can help solve many of the problems our society faces and also just help our state and our country move forward. I, I find great passion of those things and hopefully I'll be able to have some sort of impact in the future. So any possible chance we could see you on a ballot in the future <laughs> as one of our future elected officials? Well, we will see. Um, I would love to serve in a capacity that I could actually make a difference. And I think our policymakers do have a role in bringing about social change and social progress. Um, and hopefully one day, if I am lucky enough to be in a position like that, that I could perhaps do some good 
here perhaps in the, in the city of Peoria, in the state of Arizona, and perhaps we'll see maybe the country. Well, I know our future is bright with you <laughs> heading off into the world and of course with you heading off into Harvard. Big congratulations Thank you to so you. Much. Uh, it's been wonderful to watch all the great things that you've done here in the community and here at Centennial High School. So thank you, Ian. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Governor Ducey's budget proposal calls for a mandatory 5% cut in what are deemed non-classroom expenses in order to put classrooms first. What the proposal does not make clear is that non-classroom expenses provide vital resources to the students and teachers in our schools. The three to five million dollars in cuts Peoria Unified would be forced to make would stifle access to technology, impact the school lunch program, compromise security staff positions, eliminate school nurses, and could limit the extracurricular activities available to students. These cuts affect the health, safety, and academic excellence our community has come to expect. What is proposed as hashtag classrooms first has a very real impact on your child's classroom. Stay informed and take action by visiting our website to learn more about non-classroom expenses and how they will impact your student, your school, your family, and your community. Well, I'm so pleased to be joined by Justin Dent from McCarthy Building Companies. He's the project director for McCarthy. Thank you for being here today, Justin. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I want to talk a little bit about a very big project that McCarthy was just involved in in North Peoria. Very exciting for our community. Can you tell me a little bit about Sunset Heights Elementary School? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sunset Heights was a, a great project for us. It was really it was really key, the early collaboration with all the stakeholders from the, board, the governing board, the, the district administration, the city of Peoria, the community itself, as well as the design and construction group, really put together a good vision for what Sunset Heights is today. It, it's really, you know, we are very passionate about what we do, and so it's really neat to see the district with that same passion. And some of the flexible learning spaces and that adaptive situation that they've been left, that the school district and the students have been left with, is really going to be a long-term benefit. We also feel our, our main contribution to the project was really some creative solutions, that, allowing the project to finish under budget and just a little bit early, which allowed the staff to get situated, comfortable, and when the learning process was ready to start, when school started, it, it went seamlessly. Well, under budget and all t on time is always a great That's thing. always a bonus, right? It is, and the kids there, I know, are just loving what you have built. So Absolutely. thank you for that contribution you to our it. community and to our district. It's wonderful. I know McCarthy also celebrated a kind of a big milestone last year. The Pure Unified School District's in the process of celebrating one as well. But tell me a little bit about your celebration and about the big anniversary that you just uh, were a part of. Okay, great. So it, it is an exciting time at McCarthy right now. We, we just celebrated last year our 150th anniversary, and that includes 35 years here in the Valley as a, a really a community-based builder. A couple other milestones for us as well last year, we were named the 2014 Southwest Contractor of the Year. And, and while we're very proud of that and, and all the achievements that McCarthy as a company has had, it, it isn't without the, the clients and, and folks like the Peoria School District. And, and in that vein, so Sunset Heights has been nominated itself for a, an award, for de a development award for this year. So the district, McCarthy, and the design team are really hopefully going to share in that <laughs> in, a, in a couple weeks. Well, we're looking forward to hearing how that shakes out. And it's, it's an honor just to be nominated for that award. Absolutely. And it's a beautiful building, so it's very well deserved. Something else I want to talk to you about, this is the second consecutive year now that McCarthy has stepped up to serve as the title sponsor for the Peoria Education Foundation's Visionary Awards Dinner. We're just thrilled and so grateful that you'll be our title sponsor. Why was that important to you? So um, we mentioned the community-based builder. That's been a tradition of ours for 150 years is, is getting involved in the community, and that's more than just construction. That is really understanding the needs, being in touch with the community, and you know, ultimately supporting where we live. Um, the visionary dinner itself is, is really neat because it really exemplifies those beliefs in that you need to support your community and you need to be a leader in your community. And, and really supporting the foundation, it's, it's really an honor of ours to be able to support the foundation because those core values fall right in line with ours. 
Well, so many students, so many teachers are going to benefit thanks to your support, to McCarthy, and certainly thank you to you, Justin, for being here today. It's an honor to be a part of the team, and thank you for having us. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be joined by Adriana Parsons. She's the director for the Met Professional Academy, housed inside Peoria High School's Old Main. Adriana, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Danielle. You're welcome. Tell us a little bit about the Met Professional Academy. The Met Professional Academy stands for Medical Engineering and Technology, and it's a professional immersion program for high school students. It's really an entrepreneurial approach to education that motivates students by putting them in a real professional setting and helping them get that competitive edge by providing them with dual enrollment opportunities and opportunities for mentorships with real business partners. That's wonderful. So it's got the three strands, yes. medical, engineering, and technology. I understand technology is well underway and there mm -hmm. are students in the program now. Tell us a little bit about what those technology students are experiencing. Our technology strand focuses on computer networking and cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So right now our partnership is with Australia Mountain Community College our students right now this semester can earn seven community college credits. They're learning in an ethics and information technology program as well as an introduction to computer networking where they can earn Cisco certification as part of the program. So tell us a little bit about what's next on the horizon as you bring in these other two strands. We're excited to announce a partnership with Grand Canyon University for our medical strand. Students that want to explore health science careers can do so with Grand Canyon University and earn those college credits as a part of the Met Professional Academy. They'll be studying biology, chemistry, general anatomy and physiology, all with the support of Grand Canyon University. The unique thing about this partnership is that students that have a 3.25 GPA, they can apply to be a part of this program and Grand Canyon will cover the cost of tuition for those dual enrollment That's wonderful, credits. what a great opportunity. Absolutely. So this is really for those students that have a specific aptitude in, in one of these three areas and really want to go on uh, beyond high school and pursue one of these areas. Absolutely, we want to give the students a competitive edge when they leave high school, they're prepared to move on to their college aspirations, but then also give them a professional experience. So through the leverage of, of using these partnerships to say, Grand Canyon University, do you have support for our students to go on campus and maybe be a part of your cadaver lab? Maybe go on and work in a professional setting for one of the, the clinical hospitals here in the area. We want to give the students a professional immersion as well as the opportunity to earn college credit. Now you mentioned a couple of different partnerships that are already established and that are really critical to the success of the program. How would a partner that maybe is watching this today and wants to get involved in some way, how would they go about doing that? We're taking a unique approach by offering a three-tiered model for our partners who want to get involved. We have a visioning level, a mentorship level, and an enterprising level. The visioning level is for those partners that want to provide their expertise and input in the vision and development of our Met Professional Academy, whether it's for the, the academy as a whole or medical engineering or technology strand. We have our mentoring tier, which is very important to the development of our students, and that's through the support through mentorships, job shadows, internships, coming into the classroom and doing a guest lecture. That's a part of the, the program that's really unique to the Met Professional Academy. Our enterprising tier is for those partners who want to look to our students as an extension of their workforce. If partners have some sort of authentic project, they can share it with our students to work on at the Met Professional Academy. Well, it sounds like such an exciting program, such a wonderful opportunity for so many students. If there are students who are watching this, how do they enroll in the program? What is the process? We have an online application. Uh, it's available through the Peoria Unified School District's main website. The students can go on our website, learn more about the program, and download the application. There are three narrative responses the student needs to take some time with because it helps us identify what their career aspirations are and what they hope to get out of the program. Uh, and really, it's submitting the application right now because these, pro these strands are filling up quickly. They're filling up fast. Mm -hmm. We have engineering and medical that are going to be on board for the fall yes. of next year. So very important that students apply now. Absolutely. Very good. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Adriana. We look forward to watching this program flourish. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. 
I don't know what a budget is, but my mom and dad keep talking about it. I know it involves my school. I love my nurse. She helps me feel better. My teacher is terrific. The lunch ladies make the best food. I don't know what a budget is, but I know I love my school. I'm so pleased to be joined by our Deputy Superintendent in the Peoria Unified School District, Dr. Heather Cruz. Dr. Cruz, thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure, Danielle. We've got some pretty heavy topics to discuss and I want to just dive right in. Uh, there was a really big announcement last week that came out of the Peoria mm -hmm. Unified School District. Uh, discussion about exploring a four-day school week. This is of course in response to the governor's proposed budget and that there will be a significant reduction in funding for education that comes out of this budget. Uh, revolutionary mm -hmm. concept this four-day school week. Could you talk just a little bit about uh, what that looks like for the Peoria Unified School District. How are you going about conducting a study? Well, Danielle, we have a large team that we've assembled, um, really lots of different key stakeholders in our district that represent all those different key roles um, to really look at the feasibility of a four-day school week for our district. Um, we're doing lots of reach out. We'll be, um, I believe a survey was sent out to our employees and our parents last week and um, we're getting those survey responses now. Survey's still open at this time. Um, but we hope to collect all of that data and bring that back to really look at it all together to say, is this truly a feasible concept for the Peoria Unified School District? And really the goal with this four-day school week is to minimize the impact to our students and our classrooms as much as humanly possible. And as far as impact, you bring up a really good point. What would the impact be on the Peoria Unified School District if this budget is to be passed? Um, if I'm going off the facts and figures of our Cracker Jack CFO, uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, he estimates anywhere between three and five million dollars, um, which seems like a broad span, but until we get more details about the, the governor's budget, um, we're not really able to narrow it down any further than that. But even three to five million, um, given the fact that we've been cut over 24 million in the last several years is, is incredibly significant to the Peoria School District. And just a point of clarification on this four-day schedule. We hear a lot of parents that say, how could you even look at a four-day schedule as an option when there are a required 180 days of school? Can you provide some clarity ar around what the law says there? Uh, that's partially correct. Uh, the statute does require 180 days. However, they did change the statute a few years ago to say 180 days or the equivalent of so many given hours for different grade bands. So uh, we are looking at the number of hours of instruction uh, for different grade bands as a part of our feasibility study. One of which are the many components that you're looking at in order to determine One of if the this many, is feasible. absolutely. Sure, sure. Now what about reducing the schedule down to four days? Would that necessarily mean that kids are in school for 10 hours a day or, or what might that look like? I know that's still being researched, but, but, but can you clarify that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I, it, it probably will equate to a little more time in the day. Um, in some grade levels, we already exceed the number of hours required by statute. So, um, you know, at this moment in time, I don't want to make any uh, conjecture, but it, it probably will be a little bit more time, but probably not, you know, a three or four more hours a day. So um, I know there's some, some crazy uh, statisticians out there that are running some numbers and they've come up with some crazy things right now but um, we're working on that that's a part of what our team is doing and we hope to bring some of that forward uh, towards the end of our study okay and I know many parents have said you know I work five days a week child care mm -hmm. is, is something that is of concern is this a component of the research that the feasibility team is looking at uh, it, this is a significant consideration, Danielle. Um, that's very real for our parents, and certainly we want to take that into consideration as we're doing the study um, to see what options may be provided for parents. Um, and of, of course, that's an, uh, one of many, many considerations, you know, transportation, um, and of course, the biggest being the cost savings. Sure. So that's all part of, of what we'll look at. I also want to ask you a little bit about, many people have heard in the media that there is this lawsuit around Prop 301. Can you talk just a little bit about those billions of dollars that are owed to school districts? And, and many are saying, well, why couldn't we just use some of that money? Um, 
That'd be great uh, if we could. However, that is still tied up in the court system. Um, we are waiting on that to be resolved. However, you can't, you can't just wait and, and plan on that funding to come in. We're not sure what any, um, we're not sure what the date is that that's gonna, that's gonna come to fruition for our district. Um, it does need, mean significant dollars for our district. Um, and we do look forward to that, that coming to us at some point in time. However, we need to plan for now and today. Uh, we cannot wait on the courts to decide that. It's been in the courts for several years already. And can you clarify a little bit, non-classroom expenses is really the, the biggest component of the governor's proposed budget, and that's what this three to five million would encompass that we'd be required to cut from an area defined as non-classroom expenses. Can you shed some light on what are some things here in the Peoria Unified School District that, that are defined as non-classroom expenses? Uh, absolutely, Danielle. There's um, a lot of misunderstanding around what non-classroom expenses are, and it really is anything outside of the classroom. Um, administration certainly is part of that. Um, it actually is the smallest part of non-classroom expenses. Uh, utilities, uh, transportation, food service, all of our wonderful classified support personnel, um, our payroll department, uh, people want to get paid. That's a non-classroom expense. So it's important that people understand what all of those entail and that they are critical to the um, smooth running of, and efficiency of our school district. So non-classroom expenses then really do support what goes on inside the classroom. Danielle, without question, um, I will talk about psychologists that help support our, our, some of our most needy students, our nurses. My goodness, can you imagine a school without a nurse? Um, you know, all of our instructional aides that are right there sitting side by side our students, um, helping them with their, their academic work throughout the day. So there's, and I could go on, there's more and more um, out there, but they are critical to the classroom, um, which is why I think we've come to this juncture to say if we cut any more um, of those non-classroom expenses, we truly are down to affecting the health and safety and welfare and academic achievement of our students. That's very good. Uh, Dr. Cruz, if we have parents and community members who want to make sure their voice is heard regarding this budget so that we're not continuing to be in this position, where can they go to learn more about some of the things she's talked about and also to contact their elected officials? Danielle, that's a great point. On our front-facing website to our community, right underneath those wonderful pictures of our students, there's a link that says hashtag my school. I would encourage all parents and community members to click on there. Behind there is a robust website that's been built out with information about the legislature, how to speak on a bill mm -hmm. um, without actually going down to the legislature online. Um, also information on those non-classroom expenses, information and specifics around Governor Ducey's budget proposal. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of rich resources there. I would encourage our, our community to go there and make their voice be heard. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cruz. Appreciate you being here today. Uh, always a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Recently, our superintendent, Dr. Denton Santorelli, had an opportunity to be at our parent legislative dinner. We had a great panel of our elected officials represented that evening as well. They were there to really weigh in on educational issues that impact the Peoria Unified School District. A big thank you to each of them for being with us that evening. Well, at the close of our panel discussion, Dr. Santorelli gave some excellent closing remarks, and we want to make sure we provide those to you. Let's take a look. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Zeri, and, and certainly my heartfelt appreciation for uh, your presence here this evening. Uh, parents, staff, and, and certainly our elected officials and all the students that are here, uh, there is no greater calling than helping ensure that we are properly preparing our students for success in an international uh, market. Uh, I, I just want to continue to emphasize the fact that uh, our teachers need the tools that will allow them to be internationally competitive with their students. They need the resources that support their ongoing professional development they certainly need the training and they certainly need the textbooks and technology that we all know is going to help them with their work with students. Whether we're talking about private, charter, or public, our mission is all the same, provide the very best for our students. I do worry, I've been doing this for a long time, 
uh, just a couple of, of things that we've noticed uh, over the last four years are unprecedented cuts, and we certainly recognize the importance of that. We continue to hear things that we, we have to reduce overhead and, and non-classroom support, and I can tell you that we've cut over $30 million of non-classroom support in the last four years, reading intervention, gifted teachers, librarians, instructional coaches, and I could go on and on. Uh, I worry a little bit more about uh, the 5% reallocation in the governor's proposal. Um, in Peoria, that's 3.6 million plus dollars of money to further reduce the support that our teachers need. And, and I, as I look at this and try to figure out what the impact is for, for Peoria, we're down to not just academic support, we're now down to health and safety levels. So 3.6 million plus of reassignment of that 5% in Peoria is over 100 FTEs, assistant principals, nurses, security guards. You see where I'm going. We are talking about basic health and safety kinds of things. We're talking about setting set points in our room so that the temperatures are higher than what they've ever been. We're talking about setting them, you know, very low in the, in, at other times. So I just implore our, our elected officials to, to think deeply about that 5% reallocation. Uh, it, it is far more than just uh, the salary of the superintendent and, and other administrators that do the work every day. And I know the decisions are hard, and I know that there's a short of resources. And uh, I know that with conversations across the aisle and without uh, uh, division, we can get through these tough times. But never forget, we want our teachers to have the best tools to do the best that they can in the classrooms. We send our soldiers to war with the equipment they need to be successful. We send our firefighters to fight fires, the protective equipment and fire hoses. We're not sending our teachers into our classroom to do what they need to do. In fact, uh, with all due respect to all of your time, uh, I can't tell how much I appreciate you being here. It sends a wonderful message about the importance that we all place on the future of this great country we all live in. Thank you very much. One of the most exciting events of the year is our annual Pull the Bus event to benefit Valley of the Sun United Way. Before we close our show, we'll leave you with some footage from last year's exciting event. That's all for this episode of the Education News Show. We'll see you next time. Two, one, pull! And they're looking at the